I just got a Kindle Scribe. Have been playing with it since yesterday. I got it yesterday. Really enjoying it more than I thought, actually. I wasn't going to get it, and a coworker mentioned his and told me that he just absolutely loves his. I thought, I do have a lot of Kindle books, so there's a lot of the value is already in there. I'm locked in. Some very quick thoughts on it. Writing is super responsive. I've used Kindle devices. I love them. I've had one for the past 10 years and have probably bought one every two years. You just kind of get used to how long it takes to turn a page. I thought it might be similar with the pen, but it just writes immediately. You can't just like write in the margins of a book. So if that's the experience you're looking for, that you'll be able to read your Kindle books and write in the margins, underline text. It's not going to work like that. You highlight text and you can add a sticky note and then that's where you can draw, write whatever notes you want. But if you want to grab a page, scribble something at the top left, scribble something in the middle of the page and then on the bottom and then be able to see all of that together, that's really not the experience. At worst, I thought, hey, this will just be a Kindle with a giant screen. It has been excellent for that. There's a lot of value already in there because of all of the books I've bought. It might be like 11 years now. Uh, since I first bought a Kindle. It was the last Kindle that had a physical keyboard on it. Actually, probably my favorite one. I don't know if that's just nostalgia, but I did really like that one. I dropped it. From what I remember, I dropped it on an elliptical. It cracked. I remember it was like a pretty significant fall. I don't know if it just completely broke after that, but it didn't last much longer than that. The book that I'm going to talk about today is called The Practice by Seth Godin. It's a book I've read before. I went back through, highlighted certain things, and then did some drawings. And the idea is that I'll make a video where I'll show highlighting and drawing in the Kindle while sharing some thoughts on the practice. And part of that is this idea that I've read a bunch of these different books and I haven't made a podcast or made a video for all of them. I don't think that it'd be a healthy mindset to think, oh, every single book I read needs to also have some kind of output to it. But sometimes I'm like, oh, I need to read an entirely new book to do a video. And it's like, no, I don't. I've read books. I've done the work. I can make something around that and share some ideas from books I've already read. I've got seven notes here, so I'll just go through them. Number one, it's this quote, creativity is a choice. It's not a bolt of lightning from somewhere else. There's a practice available to each of us, the practice of embracing the process of creation in service of better. The practice is not the means to the output. The practice is the output because the output is all we can control. I like that idea. Who I usually think of is Austin Kleon where he says, to become the thing, you must do the verb. So if you want to be a writer, you need to write. If you wrote a book 10 years ago, but you don't really write anything now, then you're probably not a writer anymore. For me, I used to program. I used to be paid to program. Some part of me, I still like to think, oh yeah, I'm a programmer, but I I don't program day to day. I haven't programmed day to day for years now. I'm no longer a programmer and that's okay. A lot of people write every day. Not all of them are writers. In the sense of the practice, it is putting stuff out into the world. Doing the practice is putting something out into the world for it to be viewed by others, criticized by others. If you're just journaling privately, you're not a writer in that sense. The idea here is a key part of the practice is the output. The note that I drew here was like a picture of a auger's camera. A lot of there, there's a subset of cameras where the main feature of it is that the LCD screen can fold out so that you can look at yourself. The main reason is the popularity of people shooting videos facing the camera. What I was saying is it was interesting because now you can turn your practice into content. (laughs) You can actually share your practice itself. I'm going to refer back to Austin Kleon where he talks about show your work. It's something that the internet enables. It enabled through blogs before where you could share scraps of things. For popular creative work that comes to mind where you could see the scraps of things are DVD special features for films. That was filmmakers showing their work, but it was way after the fact. They couldn't really share much stuff in progress. Peter Jackson embraced the internet. I don't know that he was sharing a ton of stuff behind the scenes as he was making Lord of the Rings, but he was answering questions from people during the process of creating it and really embracing early days of the internet. Now you can look up anyone doing their practice. It can literally be like just them practicing. You can see people 
drawing or shooting like lethal shooter he's a instagram uh, influencer trains nba and other basketball athletes and teaches them how to shoot he shows himself practicing and shows himself training others who are doing their practice so now practice can become the output itself Oh, I should move on to the next highlight. We're pretty deep in here. The next highlight is your work is too important to be left to how you feel today. On the other hand, committing to an action can change how we feel. If we act as though we trust the process and do the work, then the feelings will follow. Waiting for a feeling is a luxury we don't have time for. This can be resistance in itself, this belief that you need to feel good to create the work that you're setting out to do. There's another highlight further on that will be about believing too much in like flow as well. What I drew was a oh, very simple clock. It's that quote. I only write when ins- inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes at nine every morning attributed to William Faulkner. That's the idea of treating your creative work like a job. Oftentimes it is actually the job. I also drew another thing here where it says action leads to inspiration. Take action even if you aren't feeling it. That can often lead to inspiration. It can often lead to good work, even if you started in a less than ideal state. Thanks for listening to the Psychology of Fitness episodes, if you listen to those. With fitness, if you only worked out when you felt good, you will not build up the consistency. There's just going to be days where you aren't quite feeling it, but you need to do the workout. The hard part is not the easy days where you're feeling super strong coming into the gym. The hard part is the hard days where you still choose to work out. The next quote is this one about flow. Seth Godin says, Some creators use a blank piece of paper as a trigger. Others feel that way at the piano keyboard or when they take the podium at a meeting. If we condition ourselves to work without flow, it's more likely to arrive. It all comes back to trusting ourselves to create the change we seek. We don't agree to do that after flow arrives. We do the work, whether we feel like it or not, and then... Without warning, flow can arise. Flow is a symptom of the work we're doing, not the cause of it. This is one of the biggest takeaways for me from this book. What I drew here was a bunch of scribbles and then flow and then a straight line after that to show how smooth things are after flow. Flow is what's energizing about creative work, but you have to go through that sort of crazy part before it where you're not feeling it to get into that flow state. You can do certain things to shorten that amount of time. You can do your prep work. You can get enough sleep. All, all these different things before you sit down to do the creative work. But there's still going to be like that initial period where you're not in flow. You can't just instantly be in flow. The best is you have your routine down so much that you put the headphones on and then you're able to get into flow quickly. It, it takes a while to be able to get to that sort of practice where you're able to get in flow very quickly. The other note that I wrote down was in search of a video game analogy. What came to mind was Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. This was the first Street Fighter game that had a super meter and super moves. Marvel vs. Capcom 2. You, you start with a full meter. You can fill it up three times, but you start with a full one. But in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, it starts empty and you have to build it up first before you can do a super move. Start doing the work and trust that your flow meter will build up and then you'll enter a flow state. If you choose to only write when you're in flow, then you may never get there in the first place. Similar to that idea of inspiration. Flow comes when you do the work. Next quote, the trap is this, only after we do the difficult work does it become our calling. Only after we trust the process does it become our passion. Do what you love is for amateurs. Love what you do is the mantra for professionals. I drew this Venn diagram of two hearts. I I don't know that the diagram actually makes sense, but I did write, it's easier to find fun in your work than it is to find work that is fun. That said, it can take years and years to find work that you love, work that is fun, but it is important to continue to pursue that. It's kind of this whole parallel set of tasks on one hand, you have your current work. You're trying to find find pieces of that work that you love doing, while at the same time, at the macro level, continuing to set yourself up for future work that you love. I also wrote that there's this link to this article that came to mind from Paul Graham. It's called How to Do What You Love, and I'll 
read an excerpt from this one. He says, if you work hard at being a bond trader for 10 years, thinking that you'll quit and write novels when you have enough money, what happens when you quit and then discover that you don't actually like writing novels? Most people would say, I'd take that problem. Give me a million dollars and I'll figure out what to do. But it's harder than it looks. Constraints give your life shape. Remove them and most people have no idea what to do. Look at what happens to those who win lotteries or inherit money. Much as everyone thinks they want financial security, the happiest people are not those who have it, but those who like what they do. So a plan that promises freedom at the expense of knowing what to do with it may not be as good as it seems. That's the end of that quote. I was definitely raised with that idea that you retire and then you go hang out on the beach all the time. And that's the ideal. But over time, it does seem to be a good idea to try to picture what you would actually want to do after you retire and then figure out ways to prototype that, to try to test out that retirement in some way. Try to hang out at the beach for two weeks and see if it doesn't get a little bit old by then. On the other hand, given enough time, you can look back and see what things you still enjoy doing and still would do for free. At this point, I've been doing the podcast for five years, very much on and off. I've taken months and months off at a time, but I always come back to it. I've definitely never been paid to do this. I kind of know that I'm going to enjoy doing this in the future. I know that I'll always enjoy reading and writing notes and thinking through new ideas. That's certainly something that I think about as I think about the future and a future beyond a nine to five job. I drew a chart similar to the flow chart. In the flow chart, it is up and down and left and right until you get to flow. In the same way, that's how a career can look until you find something that you love to do, and then you stay in that work long enough to verify that it is something that you love to do. Oftentimes, what can happen is you actually do love something. It becomes something that you are paid to do all day. There are very few things that you can do all day, every day, that don't start to feel like a job. Jobs tend to feel like jobs. Next quote, You manage to find an hour every day to bathe, to eat, to commute, to watch Netflix, to check your email, to hang out, to swipe at your phone, to read the news, to clean the kitchen. Show us your hour spent on the practice and we'll show you your creative path. That's the end of the quote. I drew a mind map here. A book that I finished recently is called Tranquility by Tuesday by Laura Vanderkam. It's about focusing on your time taking a look at how you're spending your time and suggestions for how to manage your time. Planning weekly and being deliberate about how you spend your leisure time. You have a lot of leisure time often that just disappears because it's unplanned and then it just gets sucked into your phone. A phrase that's stuck in my mind is time confetti. It is this idea that You have five minutes here, 10 minutes there, three minutes, five minutes. One way is to batch things so that you have more combined free time. Time confetti is taking those other scraps of time and having activities to do with them, having better activities. Because for me, and I'm guessing for much of the world, it's to check your phone. The app might change, but checking your phone is pretty universal at this point. Maybe you have some time confetti, good, positive activities I don't think all social media is negative. I think it can be a good tool, but there's a difference between using it for 15 minutes a day versus two hours a day. Now, what I've done, I've tried to swap out my usual checking of Instagram, Twitter for Readwise to reread my highlights or Kindle. If I have three or five minutes, I have one book in mind that I'm trying to get through. My main focus is getting my workout in. But I am always happy when I can get an hour of reading and writing in. Speaking of the practice, I've also been recording some of the lifts. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with these, but I send them to friends sometimes. Not everything has to be shared publicly. It can be fun for social motivation to keep a good habit going. Two more highlights. He says, seeing the tools and ingredients ready to go, prepared with care, opens the door for intentional action. That's the end of the quote. This is from a chapter about mise en place. That's food prep, but he is talking about, as an analogy for creative work, you want to set yourself up to be able to sit down and then get to work. It reminds me of 
Calm Newport. He has a podcast. And in one of the episodes, he talks about since last May, he has been working on his new book, Slow Productivity. He says, for the most part, it was waking up every day, knowing he has two hours of writing and knowing not to waste it. There was clarity in what was most important to get the book finished. He finished. He's definitely one of the most thoughtful people about knowledge, work, productivity. So it's cool to hear him talk about how he executed it himself. Mise en place gives you clarity of what the next step is going to be. My own personal story, my friends, a friend of the pod, helped me get a job at Subway. I was a terrible sandwich artist, made bad sandwiches. I was slow. And my friends still joke about this and just how bad I was at this job. It was my first job. One thing that I was not bad at, I'm not saying I was exceptionally good at it either, but I don't think there were a lot of complaints about my prep work. I came in 6 a.m. when I had to arrive, and then it's prep for an hour until the breakfast hours start. I was ready to serve breakfast after that is where it falls apart, but I did that prep work. This doesn't really relate to this creation process because it's saying that you'll do a good job because of the good prep work, but oh man, imagine if I didn't do a good job with the prep work, I'd be even worse. Next, I'll end it with this quote. Seth Godin says, All creative work has constraints because all creativity is based on using existing constraints to find new solutions. When I think of constraints, I think of being stuck in a steel cage, which leads to excellent matches in wrestling. The wrestler's constraint is physical constraint. They're in that cage. It's different from what they're used to, being in a ring with ropes. It leads to creative things like smashing their opponent's face into the cage. They have one way to win, which is to escape the cage. And then there's two options. Usually the heel just tries to go through the door. The baby face takes the honorable way and tries to climb up over the cage as it intended. In creative work, constraints create creativity. Vine, TikTok, you see a lot of creativity because of this shortened amount of time, six seconds with Vine. And then originally, I think it was 15 seconds with TikTok. You'll get creative if you start to restrict the amount of tools that you use. You'll find new ways to use them, new things that you can make with them. Now we're seeing a pretty interesting thing with AI-generated art. You can kind of create anything, but you're constrained to inputting text. It's somewhat odd now that you can create something closer to a Marvel comic panel more easily with these tools than you could create a simple black circle using the same tool. I don't know where the future is headed with this explosion of AI tooling, but I do know that personal creative practices will not go away and will continue to be valuable far into the future. Thanks for listening.